We are so happy you decided to join us here today at Church on the Rock. If this message touches you in any way, let us know about it. You can email pray at jesustherock.org or you can look us up on Facebook or Twitter, Church on the Rock, Pascagoula. If you would like to know how our ministries are touching the lives of others, you can go to jesustherock.org. While you're there, consider fueling our passion to reach the lost and the unsaved by giving to us. You can click on the donate button at the top right hand corner of the screen of our website. Again, thank you for joining us and welcome to Church on the Rock. Today, I want to talk to you about two things that Jesus came into the world to do. Certainly, he did more than these two. In fact, next week, I'll talk to you about a third thing that he came into the world to do. But today, I want to talk about two very important things that Jesus came to do. Um, Number one, Jesus came into the world in order to put religion in its place. Jesus came into the world in order to put religion in its proper place. Understand, religion has a place. Religion has a place. The law of God has a place. The commandments of God have a place. The problem happened when religion and the commandments and the laws got out of place. They got out of order. They didn't necessarily get out of order. People got them out of order. When mankind began to worship religion more than God, when mankind began to worship the commandments more than the commander, when when mankind began to worship the law more than the lawgiver, things got out of balance. Jesus said you worship and serve the creation more than the creator. You're you're caught up and zeroed in on the creation and you're forgetting about the creator. And Jesus spent his life here on earth trying to right this wrong. He came to put religion back in its proper place. He said, I didn't come to destroy the law. Don't, Don't mistake that. But I came so that the law through me might be fulfilled. You've gotten the law of God and and the commandments of God out of place. I'm going to do what the law can't do, never could do, never will do. I'm going to make a way for you to be saved. And when he left, the apostle Paul picked up this mantle, and he began to take off where Jesus left off. Because this right, Jesus made it right, but it still was wrong in the minds of people. We were still thinking wrong and particularly in the book of Galatians, which is my favorite letter that Paul wrote to the churches. And I'm going to probably read a little bit more than I usually do today, but I want to encourage you. It's only six chapters. Go back and just read this whole letter because that's what it is, a letter. Don't think of it as a book. It's a letter that Paul wrote to the church. And you can read it in probably eight or ten minutes, the whole letter. I'm going to just read... uh, portion of it today, and this will kind of lay the foundation for what the problem is, as Paul sees the problem, uh, particularly in the church. Now, before I get into the chapters, some of your Bibles, like mine does, if you go back to the beginning of the book or the letter, it'll give you some information. In other words, this one says the author is Paul the Apostle, date written around 49 AD, about 49 years after the death of Christ. And then it tell, it says content, and it gives us a little synopsis of what this whole letter is about. So I want to read you, before I get into the actual letter, I want to read you the content. Here's the content of the letter. Who, after being set free, would ever willingly submit themselves to slavery again? It's a fair question. Who, after being set free, would ever willingly submit themselves to slavery again? This was Paul's question to the Galatians, who were giving up their freedom in Christ to serve the law again. It was clear to the early church that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ achieved salvation for all who believed. But what did this mean for the law of Moses? Should Christians continue observing the law or not? The Galatian church was divided over this question. Paul wrote this letter to the Galatians to settle the dispute. He opened his letter with a very short introduction and then cut right to the heart of the matter. If believers are justified by grace through Christ, why were many Galatians insisting upon other requirements? Paul drew a lesson from Abraham who lived more than 400 years prior to the giving of the law. Paul showed that Abraham was justified by his faith, not his deeds. 
Likewise, the Galatians should see themselves as free from the law, free, that is, to serve Christ and be transformed by the Holy Spirit. So that's the synopsis of the whole letter here. Now I'm going to read, instead of just reading through, you can do that on your own, but I'm going to read some portions. Chapter 1, and I want to read verses 6 through 10. And just listen as Paul is, is begging and pleading with the church here at Galatia. In verse 6, he says, I'm shocked. I'm shocked that you are turning away so soon from God who called you to himself through the love and mercy of Christ. You're following a different way that pretends to be the good news, but is not the good news at all. You're being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning Christ. Let God's curse fall on anyone, including us, or even an angel from heaven who preaches a different kind of good news than the one we preach to you. I say again, what we have said before, if anyone preaches any other good news than this one, let that person be cursed. Obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. So he says, you got this right. You were made free by believing in Jesus Christ and accepting Jesus Christ. But something happened. Someone came in, and the King James says, began to preach a different gospel, a different word. And now you've taken the gift of Jesus Christ, and you've sort of put it aside. You, you were perfected by Christ, but now you're trying to stay perfect by keeping the law again. You've gone back into slavery and given up the freedom in Christ. So the next little passage I want to read is in chapter 3. Beginning with verse 1, he says, Foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? King James says, who has bewitched you? Who's cast an evil spell on you? The meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be? After starting your new lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? You, you knew you couldn't get saved by your effort. You knew that you were, we were all sinners. You knew that none were righteous. You accepted Christ. Now you're trying to be made perfect by your own human effort. Have you experienced so much for nothing? Surely it was not in vain, was it? I ask you again, does God give the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? Of course not. It's because you believe the message you heard about Christ. In the same way, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. The real children of Abraham are those who put their faith in God. What's more, the Scriptures look forward to this time when God would declare the Gentiles to be righteous because of their faith. God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago when he said, all nations will be blessed through you. So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessings Abraham received because of faith. But those who depend on the law to make them right with God, listen to this, those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under his curse. Those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under his curse. For the scriptures say, cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the commands that are written in the book of the law. Cursed is everyone who does not obey all the commands, all the laws that are written in the book of the law. So it is clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. For the scriptures say it's through faith that a righteous person has life. This way of faith is very different from the way of law, which says it is through obeying the law that a person has life. But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoings. For it is written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who hung on a tree. Through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing he promised to Abraham so that we who are believers might receive the promise, Holy Spirit, through faith. So again, he brings us home again. And the, the, the interesting thing in here is he says, when you begin to try to perfect yourself or to stay in God's good graces by keeping the law, you become cursed because he said, if you could do it, the only way to, to, to be 
made right before God by keeping the law is to keep every law and every commandment perfectly. And, and don't just get caught up with the Big Ten because there were over 630-something laws given. Some of them are incredible. There's no way that mankind, any mankind, any mankind outside of Jesus himself could ever keep the law and the commandments. And so he says, you're cursed already if that's what you're banking on because if you're going to go that way, you've got to go all the way and you've got to keep them all. And finally, chapter 5, verses 1 through 10, he says, so Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Listen, I, Paul, tell you this. If you are counting on circumcision, or the law, to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. I'll say it again. If you're trying to find favor with God by being circumcised, you must obey every regulation in the whole law of Moses. For if you're trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ. You've fallen away from God's grace. But we who live by the Spirit eagerly wait to receive by faith the righteousness God has promised to us. For when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, there's no benefit in being circumcised or being uncircumcised. What is important is faith expressing itself in love. What is important is faith expressing itself in love. You were running the race so well. Who has held you back from following the truth? It certainly isn't God. He's the one who called you into freedom. This false teaching is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough. I'm trusting the Lord to keep you from believing false teachings. God will judge that person, whoever he is, who has been confusing you. So Paul, just like Jesus, picks up the mantle and he comes to put religion in its place, to put the law in its place, to put the commandments in its place. Paul, in one place, he calls the law our schoolmaster. He said the law was our schoolmaster. The law was our teacher. The law was our instructor. People sometimes look at me funny when I say, but I'm, I'm so earnest in this, that the law was not given for you to keep. The law was given in order to show you you cannot keep it. The law was given in order to show you you cannot keep this. You don't believe it? Give it a try. Give it a try for an hour. See how you make out. Go back and read the 630-something laws of Christ. See how you're doing. If you have on a shirt or dress, ladies, or something that's 50% cotton, 50% polyester, you just broke the law. That's one of the laws. All cloths shall be of one thread type, not two. The, the laws are insane. And if you think that you can keep them, the law was given to show us that we're unworthy to keep them. Sometimes, if you want to have some fun one day, Ask someone if they try to live by the Ten Commandments. And if they say yes, just say, name them. Name them. Because I'll be honest with you, most adults in America today not only don't keep the Ten Commandments, they don't even know the Ten Commandments. And how insane is it to us to say that we're going to be saved by keeping the law, that we're going to be saved by keeping the rules, that I keep the Ten Commandments when I can't even name the Ten Commandments. It's clothed in hypocrisy. You would think if heaven and hell depended on Ten Commandments, I would memorize them, at least. Even if I couldn't keep them, I would know them, right? I know Santa's reindeer's names, Donner and Blitzen and Cupid, you know those. I know those. If, if my life and my eternity depended on you would think I would at least know them, and yet you'd be surprised how many people not only don't keep them, they don't know them. You see the hypocrisy in that? Gandhi said one time that the great minister, in, in, uh, he said, I think I would become a Christian if only I could ever see one. I think I would become a Christian 
If only I could ever see one. This is why so many unbelievers remain unbelievers today because all they see is the hypocrisy and the, the nonsense of many so-called Christians and believers who are preaching one thing and teaching one thing and saying another but living something completely different. Paul said, if you're going to trust in this to save you, then you must keep every one of them to perfection. And if you miss one, that's it. You're done. So you, you get the point. Remember Jesus and his disciples, they would be walking through the cornfield, and it happened to be the Sabbath day, and they're picking corn and eating it, and here comes religion running to them saying, you can't do that. We're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, you're missing the point. He said, man wasn't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. It's, 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 a, man, it's a gift from God. You're putting religion ahead of relationship. You're putting the law ahead of people. People always trump the law. You're putting more emphasis on the commandments than you are the people. Jesus gave us his examples. Paul gave us his examples. So here's mine. The speed limit out here on Chico Street is 30 miles an hour. It's a little slow for my taste. I think it's four lane. It should be better, but they didn't ask me. It's 30 miles an hour. And I try to at least not go over the grace period, you know. Keep it under 40, you know. Watch out, Dana. But let my wife or my parents or my children or one of my grandchildren be sitting in church today and suddenly have a heart attack. Let me tell you what's going to happen. They're going to get put in that blue Dodge Charger out there, and we're going to the hospital. They may show up at the hospital with a heart attack and whiplash, but we're going in a hurry, right? Speed limit or no speed limit, we're going because people trump the law. At that point, it's not about the law anymore. It's about the people. And that's what Paul tries to say. That's what Jesus tried to say. The laws are given you know, as a, as a schoolmaster to teach us, to show us, okay, this is what the law says. Once we realize we are totally and completely incapable of keeping the law, there's not but one other option, and that's to fall on God's grace. That's to fall and cry out for God's mercy. I can't do this. He says, I know. You got it. Finally, you got it. You realize you can't keep the law. So the only other option is to throw yourself on the mercy of the court, the mercy of Jesus Christ. Jesus came to put religion in its place. The second thing Jesus came to do, he came into the world in order to elevate the value and the worth of people. In other words, he came to put people in their place, to put people in their proper place. He had to put religion in its proper place so he could elevate the value and worth of people to their proper place. And I'll just give you just a, just a few very quick examples. There were, there were so, so many. You can go through the New Testament, and they're just full of people who, because of religion, they've become devalued. They're devalued. And Jesus spent his entire ministry giving them back their value, giving them back their worth. There was the blind beggar who religion ran up to and said, why are you blind? Is it because of your sin or your parents' sin? Because somebody had to sin. If you're out here begging on the street, you're blind. Somewhere along the way, something you did wrong or your parents did wrong. And Jesus interjects himself into that situation. He says, it's not his sin or his parents' sin that caused this blindness. And he healed the man. And suddenly the man's not begging anymore and he's not blind anymore either. Jesus in one instant elevated his worth and his value. He reached out and he made him valuable. Remember the, the prostitute who crashed the church party, kneels at Jesus' feet, and religion says if he were the Messiah, he would know what kind of woman this is. And Jesus said, oh, I'm not loving her because I don't know who she is. I'm loving her because I do know who she is. In fact, he said every time the gospel is preached, you ought to tell her story because she's the only one in here that really understands salvation. Tell her story. He never said that about Moses, Abraham, David, Paul, anybody. But every time the gospel's preached, you ought to tell her story. He suddenly elevated her value and her worth. Her worth. 
She was no longer a prostitute. She was a child of God that was worshiping the Lord. Another time, a woman taken in adultery, caught in the very act, and religion drags her out and throws her at the feet of Jesus and says, what should we do? The law of Moses says she should be stoned. The Roman law says we can't stone anybody at this time in history, so what do we do? They think they have Jesus right where they want him. What are we going to do? He says, oh, by all means, the law says stoner, stoner. Here was his, here was his out, and he knew it. He said, but let the one of you who has not broken any of the laws, you cast the first stone. And a holy hush fell. Jesus said, now, just drop your rocks, shut your mouth, and go on home. And suddenly he elevated her value. He said, where are thy condemners? She said, they're, they're gone, Lord. He said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He, he, he raised her value. He raised her worth. What about children? Just children. Children in that day had basically no value. They were of no worth. They were disregarded. Many of them didn't even live, and they were certainly had no value to them, not until they reached a certain age that they were, they were not, but, and they wanted to come to Jesus, and religion stepped in and said, no, 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 you can't come to him. You can't bother him. You can't. Jesus said, wait, 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 wait. You got this all wrong. Unless you become like them, you're not even going to go to heaven. Now, let them come to me. And suddenly the children had value. The children had worth. They're sitting all over Jesus' lap, and, and he came to put people in their place. On and on and on we could go. We could talk about the thief on the cross who never did anything right. His whole life he spent sinning. And, and at the end of his life, Jesus looks at him and says, today you'll be with me in paradise. What an elevation. What worth and value he gives all because he says, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. When you come into your kingdom, remember me. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. What about the people with leprosy? They spend their life having to go through the, if they dare come into the city, they have to shout, unclean, unclean, unclean. How humiliating is that? How devaluing is that? And Jesus healed them and raised their value, raised their worth. We had a little deal at work. We've been going through a lot of changes at work and because the state auditors had come in, and, and it gets everybody kind of on pins and needles and a lot of new rules and a lot of new regulations. And they came in the other day. It's funny because the first thing they did, that was crazy, they had to come in. They said, I need to watch you wash your hands. I said, okay. So I go in and wash my hands. I said, I've been doing this probably 48, 49 years now. But, you know, so a certain way you had to wash your hands. And I so you know, in a big meeting, one of the things that they said was, every time you touch a patient, you have to sanitize your hands. And I understand because you're dealing with nurses and people who are dealing with wounds and infections and different things like that. But I didn't mention it in the meeting, but I went privately and I said, okay, here's my problem. I said, I'm not a nurse. I'm not a doctor. I don't fool with wounds. When I walk in, many times I'll take a patient's hand or I'll touch them on the shoulder or on the forehead and I'll pray for them. I said, I don't draw many lines in the sand, but I'm drawing a line in the sand. When I pray for them and I take them by the hand, I will not reach in my bag, grab my sanitizer, and scrub my hands. I just won't do it. If that's a deal killer, consider the deal killed because I won't do that. These people already feel devalued. They already feel dehumanized. And I said, I'm not. And they said, no, 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 it's okay. And then they kind of explained, if you're in a nursing home before you go from one patient to the other, you know, you need, and I'm like, I got no problem with that. But let's remember, these are people that we're dealing with. They're people. And, and I, the only thing that I'm there to do is to try to give them some value and some worth and some hope and to pray with them, not to make them feel worse than they did when I got there. Zacchaeus. What about Zacchaeus? Tax collector. Scum of society. Nobody liked him, but he heard Jesus was coming and he climbed up in a tree just to see him. And Jesus stopped and says, come down. I'm going to your house today. Now for Jesus to go into your home, that, that was a big deal. And so Jesus suddenly elevated the scum of society to the upper class and says, I'm going to your house today. He gave him value. and He gave him worth. Jesus steps over the law, and he finds value in people. And then he leaves this final command with us. 
He said, a new command I'm giving you. Last thing he said to his disciples before he left to be crucified. I'm giving you a command that trumps all other commands. On this command, you can hang all the law and all the prophets. Get this one right. You can forget about the other 630-something. Get this one right. Everything else will work. I'm commanding you to love others the way I've loved you. Just love others the same way I've loved you. And religion hates that because religion cries out, no, that's too easy. You got to do something. You got to, you got, they're not worthy of heaven. You look at the way they've lived. Look at the things they've done. They're not worthy. Now me, I'm worthy because I did this and this and this. Well, unless you've kept all 630 something laws perfectly, you're not worthy either. I'm commanding you to love others the way I've loved you. Stop looking at how someone's broken the rules and instead find a way to elevate that person's value. Find a way to elevate that person's worth. It's one of the things I love about Saturday morning men's breakfast. Many times when we come in and, and we have a, a big homeless population that comes in and eats with us, and many times we'll put them at the front of the line. You guys go first. Why? Because they spend their life being devalued. They spend their life being pushed to the back. And we say, come to the front. Come to the front of the line. Come in. Take the best seat in the house. I'm commanding you to love others the way I've loved you. Love them the same way I've loved you. Back in chapter 5, the last half of verse 6, what is important is faith expressing itself in love. Now, how that plays out in your life, I don't know. But for me, it, it changes everything. It challenges my thinking. And it changes my behavior because I no longer have to be the religious police who decides who's right and who's wrong, who's worthy of heaven and who's not worthy of heaven. I don't have to decide that. I don't have to judge that anymore. All I'm commanded to do is love others the way he loves me. Black others, white others, rich others, poor others, gay others, straight others, others I understand, others I don't understand. Just love others the way I've loved you. You don't have to fix anything else. You're not the religious police. You're not the judge who decides who gets to make it to heaven and who don't. All I'm commanding you to do is love others the way I've loved you. I'll be the judge. How freeing is that? How liberating is that? And that's what Paul came to, to preach and to teach and to try to pound into the church at Galatia. You're missing the mark. You're trying to judge who's worthy and who's not. And it's not your business. It's not your place. Your place is to love one another the way I've loved you. The rules of change. Jesus came to put religion in its proper place. There had to be religion. There had to be laws, because if there were not laws, how would we know we were breaking anything? How would we know we were wrong? You see, the hardest part of salvation is not getting people saved, it's getting people lost. It's helping people to understand their lostness. You're lost, you're broken. That's why the scriptures, the New Testament is full of things like none are righteous, no, not one. All of your righteousness is as filthy rags. It means nothing. If you're depending upon that to get you right with God, you have totally missed the mark. You've totally missed the point. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. We fall on his grace. And how liberating is that? That I don't have to judge people anymore. I don't have to decide who gets to go to heaven and who don't. All I do is trust in Jesus Christ that he died for me. His blood was shed for me. And I put my faith in him. And now my command is to love others the same way he loved me. Again, we're so incredibly glad you decided to join us here today at Church on the Rock. I pray that this message touched you in a way that only God can get the glory from. If you would like more information on our church and our ministries, you can go to JesusTheRock.org. While you're there, consider giving us a financial donation by clicking on the Donate button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Again, thank you for joining us, and have a very blessed day.